Hey everybody, welcome to the guided problems for chapter three. Um, most of these are pretty uh, pretty easy. There's one that's is, that's a little more tough, and, and I'll, I'll walk you through through all of them, of course. But uh, so let's just look at the first one. Consider the following data values: mean, median, mode, and then describe the shape of the distribution. So that's going to be pretty easy with Excel. So I'm going to open up Excel. Excel will make your life easy. If you're not comfortable with it. Um, I, I strongly suggest you you work on becoming comfortable with it rather than trying to do all these by hand. Um, because you can, you know, you can do them all by hand, but just by the end, Excel's really gonna make your life easier and better. Where's my data set at? Oh, sorry, I didn't see it download, there it is. All right. Okay, so there's my data set. So for my mean, and remember in statistics, we call the mean X bar, or it's like X with this little bar over the top of it. So Excel calls the function average. So I hit equals average, and then I just highlight the data set. And that will give me the mean or the X bar of the data. So the mean is 10. And then the median, I can just do equals median. Highlight the data set. And I get the median 15.5. Uh, and then the mode. So mode is just the number that occurs most often in the data set. So you can see in this data set that no number is repeated. So we're gonna say there is no mode in this data set. Finally, it wants us to describe the shape of the data set, uh, of, sorry, sorry, of the distribution. And so here we can see that our mean is less than our median. So That'll help us narrow this down because our mean is less than our median. The distribution is left skewed. Uh, that means it goes to the left side and that's the correct answer. Um, whatever side the mean is on that relative to the median, that's the direction that the distribution is skewed. And that's it. All right, so let's take a look at number two. So this one wants the range, the variance and the standard deviation. So same thing, I'm gonna go ahead and open this data set in Excel. It'll open in protected view, you'll see, and you just tell it, enable editing. All right, so here's our data set. So the range is just the highest value in the set minus the lowest value in the set. So the easiest way to do this in Excel is to go, come up here to data and then go to sort and you can just do this sort smallest to largest and then so for our range it's just going to be the highest number minus the smallest number. So the range of this data set is four. Variance, whoops. So variance, there's a function in Excel for it. It's VAR. And then you have to know if you have a population or a sample. So this tells us, this, this represents the number of absent students from the last nine st uh, statistics classes. So if we're just taking nine classes out of all of the classes, that's a sample. And then also your other clue is here, it says, what is the sample variance? So if we're doing a Vansel, uh, a Vansel, a sample, it's gonna be dot S, so VAR dot S, if it was a population, it would be dot P. Um, so variance dot S, and then you just highlight the data set, and that's gonna give us our variance. It wants two decimal places, 2.36. And then standard deviation, STDEV is the abbreviation for that. 
So we just do the same thing equals stdev. And again, either dot p for a population or dot s for a sample. This is a sample, so we'll say dot s. Highlight the data set, and it gives us the answer. 1.5, how many decimals? Two decimals, 1.54. So remember what these things are. So th these are measures of variability or how spread out your data set is. And so the range just tells you how spread out it is, right? It goes between one and five. So it's, it's a range of four is the difference between the highest and lowest. Um, and then the standard deviation and the variance, again, tell you, is this data really, um, really close together or really spread out? Uh, and this will become more valuable to us later when we start to try to make inferences about other data points based on uh, the information we have. All right, so the next question. All right, so this one wants us, this is, this is the one that I said was tough. Um, so I'm actually just gonna delete this information and use this blank Excel sheet. Um, so it tells us that, uh, assume the average age of an MBA student is 31.8 years. So I'm gonna say my X bar or my mean is 31.8 years. And my standard deviation is 2.7 years. So that's the information it's given me. So the first thing it asks us is to, to determine the coefficient of variation. And so the coefficient of variation, uh, we can find out uh, just by um, a, um, a basic formula. Uh, and the coefficient of variation is the standard deviation divided by the mean. So I'm just gonna say this equals the standard deviation divided by the mean. And that's often expressed as a percent. So 0 0.0849 would be 8.5 or 8.49%. It wants one decimal. So I'm going to say 8.5%. Next, they want the Z score for an MBA student who is 28 years old. So the Z score is a little confusing. So what Z score means is, um, how many standard deviations away from the mean is a given value? So if our mean or average is 31.8, then our, our z-score is gonna be how many standard deviations away from the mean of 31.8 is the value 28. Um, and so we're, it's gonna be negative because it's gonna be below the average, okay? So z-scores are either negative or positive. Uh, if they're negative, then that means they're less than the mean. And if they're positive, it means that the value is greater than the mean. So we know it's going to be negative. So I'm going to just label this the Z of 28. And then the formula for a Z score, um, you can find it in your book, uh, is, is, uh, the value x, which in this case is 28, minus x bar, which is the mean, divided by the standard deviation. So that's how we find the z-score of a given point. So I'm going to say this equals the value x. And if I wanted to, it might be smarter for me to actually make a little calculator. So I'm just, just going to call this um, x or x is 28. And the reason this is valuable is if I had to do multiple ones of these, I could just change the number here once I set this little calculator up. So it's the value x minus x bar, or the mean, divided by uh, the standard deviation. So that's how I find the z-score. So here's our notation. The z of 28 is negative 1.4. Uh, two decimal places, negative 1.41. So that means that uh, the value of 28 years old is 1.41 standard deviations below the mean. 
So and like I said, what's cool about this is once I've set this up this way, if I if for any value of x, I can say, well, where's a 50-year-old fall? Oh, they're way above, right? They're way above the mean. That'd be my z of 50. Um, so I've set up a little calculator I can use over and over again, which is helpful on the homework sometimes. All right. So using the empirical rule, the range of ages that will uh, include 99.7% of the students around the mean in interval notation is. So what they're asking is, um, is what range of students uh, will include 99.7% of all of the data set. So again, if you look in your book, you'll see that with the empirical rule um, that 68% that of all values are found within plus or minus one standard deviation of the mean. And 95% of all values are plus or minus two standard deviations. And 99.7% of all values are found within plus or minus three standard deviations. Um, and so uh, to figure this out, what we have to do is say, okay, I know what one standard deviation is, it's 2.7. So I'm looking for the mean plus or minus three standard deviations, because that will include 99.7% of all of the data points. So uh, I, you can use whatever term you want, um, but I, I'm going to call this the margin. This is, and this is going to equal three, three standard deviations times the standard deviation. And so now, the the interval that includes 99.7% of of everything uh, in the data set is going to be the mean 31.8 plus the margin and minus the margin. Okay, so the lower end of the interval is gonna be the mean X bar minus the margin. Remember we got that margin by going three times the standard deviation. And the upper limit uh, of the range is gonna be the mean plus the margin. So all or 99.7% of the data points will fall between 23.7 and 39.9. Again, this is a concept that's gonna be super important later as we start looking at confidence intervals and things like that. All right, if you thought that was hard, this is gonna get a little bit harder because now they want us to consider Chebyshev's theorem. And Chebyshev's theorem is like the empirical rule but it has a wider spread for when we're not so sure about, um, about the data we're using. We're not sure that it, it falls perfectly within a normal curve. And so uh, if we look at the Chebyshev's uh, theorem page in the book, unfortunately, it breaks down 75% is plus or minus one standard deviation. Um, and 89% is plus or minus two and 94% is plus or minus three, but the question's asking us for 95%. And so we can't do like we just did on, on this one with the empirical rule because uh, it's asking us for a percentage that is not found uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, in the, the standards, I guess, the one, two, or three standard deviation standards. So instead, we're gonna have to figure out how many standard deviations, plus or minus the mean, uh, encapsulate 95% uh, of the data. So I'm gonna pull something up here that I worked out earlier. So here's the standard formula for Chebyshev's theorem, that X is gonna equal one minus one over Z squared times 100. That's, that's what his theorem is. I know that's confusing. Um, but the Z is that Z score or the number of standard deviations away from the mean that we need to do to find this um, this range, okay? So I just sort of did a, a, an algebraic solving for Z because Z is what I'm really gonna need. So to find Z, I have to say that equals the square root of one of negative one divided by X over 100 minus one. And that's complicated. You can take my word for it if you want to, that I worked out the algebra and the algebra is correct. Um, but so what I have to do is I have to go into 
I have to go into Excel and solve for that. So I'm going to say, um, I'm just going to call this um, my Z for Chebyshev's theorem. You can call it whatever you want. OK, so in order to do that, I'm going to say this equals square root of negative 1 divided by x. Let's see. And and I used x, but x it really just means the the percentage that they're looking for. Okay, so I'm gonna I didn't put that in here, so I'm gonna put that here for now. X divided by 100 minus one. And right now it's gonna be one. So when I plug in the percent, it says within 95%, or I mean, sorry, not with, include at least 95% of students, it's gonna give me this Z-score. And the Z-score is, remember this is in standard deviation. So in order to encapsulate 95% of all of the data, I need to go plus or minus 4.47 uh, standard deviations from the mean. So my margin is gonna equal the standard deviation times this z-score for Chebyshev's theorem. So there's my margin. So my lower limit of my range is going to be my mean minus my margin. My upper limit is going to be my mean plus my margin. And then it wants one decimal. So I'm going to say 19.7. 43.9. So if we're not sure whether or not our distribution is normal, in other words, shaped like a perfect bell curve, um, and we want to find 95% of all the data points in the set, uh, we'll use Chebyshev's theorem, and we'll find out that we have to go plus or minus 4.47 standard deviations from the mean to encapsulate 95% of everything. See if I got it right, I did. And now that I've created this little calculator, it's pretty easy because the next one says the range that will include 80%. So all I have to do is change that to 80. Recalculates everything for me. And I say my lower is 25.8. And my upper is 37.8. And there we go. So like I said, this is the hard question. The others are, are quite a bit easier. Um, but hopefully I walked you through that enough that you'll be able to, to figure it out. And hopefully that your, your kind of conceptual understanding of z-scores and standard deviations will, will broaden a little because we're going to need more of that later as we move on. All right, number four. So the following table shows uh, populations, estimated populations, 12 cities. So it's a sample of cities and it wants us to find percentiles. So I'm going to open this in Excel. It'll take a second. I'll hit enable editing. All right. So what's nice about Excel for this is we can say equals percentile dot exc. That's the one we're going to use. Then it wants the array. So that just means the data set, comma, k. And in this case, k is 60 because it's the 60th percentile. Actually, I think it wants you to do it as a decimal, so it's 0.6. So that's six point, it just says type as a decimal, so I'm gonna, or as an integer, I'm gonna do round to one decimal, 6.4. So another way I could set this up, so it's a little easier, because look, I have to do three of them, is I could, uh, Put K here, and then percentile here. And then I can set up my calculator. So it, again, I do percentile.exe. 
the array is my data set, comma, and then K is this empty box here. So then all I have to do is I punch in my percentile number, 60th percentile or 0.6, and it gives me the answer. Um, and then when I have to do my next one, I already have this, it's like a calculator all set up. So for 30th, I just put in 0.3, whoops, unless I messed that up, 0.3, 4.9. And then for 85th percentile, I just put in, okay, sorry, this thing's being goofy. Actually, it's me being goofy, but 0.85. I get 8.3. So as much as you can get used to it, try to set up little calculators for yourself because that lets you repeat the process over and over and it makes your life a lot easier as you're doing multiple problems. All right, on to the last problem. Um, and this one's super easy because Excel has functions for these. So I'm gonna open the data set in Excel. I remember covariance uh, is what we're doing on this one. And this just talks about relationships between two data sets. It doesn't prove the two data sets cause each other, but it, it, it proves some relationship between them. So, it, so covariance, and again, this is a sample. So we're gonna say equals COV, so covariance dot S for a sample. It says array one, that's the first data set, comma array two. Whoops, there we go. That will give us our covariance around the two decimal places, so 3.63. And then it's gonna ask for the correlation coefficient, which is C-O-R-R-E-L, array one, first data set, comma, array two. This is the one. The correlation or the, the correlation coefficient is is a more useful measure for us because it's always between zero or negative one and one. And if it's negative, then there's a negative relationship between the data. And if it's positive, there's a positive relationship. And if it goes all the way up to one, that means it's a perfect positive relationship. That variable x goes increases one for uh, it, for every move of variable y and so forth. Um, and so our correlation coefficient is 0.56. And then it's going to ask us to describe it. So here we see there's a positive relationship. It's because it's positive, but it's not perfect, right? It's not a one. So we're going to say there is a positive linear relationship between the two variables. And that's it. So that's all of the guided problems. I hope they weren't too bad, and, uh, and I hope this helps you with the rest of the homework.